about the presence of the Lord in your life. Thank you. You don't concentrate on him. You don't concentrate on him. We don't feel it that much. That's why we pray that we get the mind of Christ. Because the mind of this world is just here and there. And we're scrolling the news and that article and this article. God knew this day would come because he said, be still. Quit looking at stuff. Quit thinking about stuff. Sit down or stand up or bow your knee or drive, whatever you're doing. And know I'm God. There are so many of us, even the people of God, that there are wounds in our hearts and our spirits from things that others have done or we did to them that we have not forgiven ourselves for. And that's something that the blood of Jesus, you literally have to believe that he has forgiven you. If you don't believe it, you'll keep apologizing to him. And that's the trick of Satan. Because when you apologize to the Lord for something you've done, and you feel the repentance of the Lord upon you, you're forgiven. You must believe in that moment that he has forgiven you. And you move forward in life to correct those things that you did that hurt someone. That heals you, right? So if you remember telling your cousin you were stupid and they remember you remember it, part of repentance is saying, I am so, that was so rude. I, I would, you know, I regret that. Because there's healing for that member and there's healing for this member. And that's forgiveness too. When they forgive you, you forgive yourself. You go, thank God. It's hard. It's difficult. It's unpleasant. But there's healing in the act of humbling ourselves before the Lord. And I just want to tell you that, that for those of you that come to church or listen on the internet, for all the times that you aren't singing, when the congregation sings, or you aren't worshiping when the congregation's worshiping, you are an observer of the presence of God. Because God doesn't demand that just this group sing. He says, enter into my gates with thanksgiving and singing. That was for all of us. Enter into my courts with praise and worship. It's not enough to be an observer of worship, no matter how long you serve the Lord. You know, some saints, they get cold in their soul, they'll just watch, hmm, I'm spiritual. Right? You know, the devil tries to get all of us from time to time. We have to self-correct. But that's how he does it. We either think we're spiritual or we think my voice doesn't sound good. Is that, was that a requirement? Did he just say, come in? Did he just say, sing? Did he just say, worship? Did he say that you could be tone deaf? Yeah, you can be tone deaf. He still wants it. Every parent wants to hear the sound of their child. They don't care what it sounds like. The more off-key, actually, the cuter it is. Oh, oh, right? So take pleasure in my offering. The offer of your father. The word Abba is an actually more intimate word that even fathers like the one to add me. Abba Father, he wants to hear the sound of your voice. Words are everything in this dispensation. Words. Can you receive the spirit? It's with the mouth, the tongue, and the words. When you curse someone, it's with the mouth, the tongue, the words. So he warns us 
whatever is in your heart is going to come out to keep your heart pure. This, this dispensation is about cleansing and keeping pure the inward, right? Keeping your heart pure, then you don't have to worry about your mouth. Keeping your mind clean, then you don't have to worry about your mouth. But this is what I want to leave you with today. The words you say are everything. They either send good things in motion, or they send curse. If you keep declaring that person lies, you're cursing them. It may be the truth that your mouth shouldn't keep saying that. The Bible says declare things that are not as if they were. That's a man of truth. Now, you know, you don't tell that somebody doesn't know them. You just don't have to, you know, say, you know what I'm saying. I'm not going to qualify. You know what I'm talking about. Words are everything. Sometimes we get down here, we, we say everything right. I believe you're doing the work. I see the, uh, your hand on the person's life. I'm trusting you for that person. Then by Monday, we say, that person's so blind. When are they going to see? We just curse them again. We're so wishy-washy with our words. But study in the Word of God. Have you come tell me if it's not about words? You either speak blessing or you speak curse. You either speak truth or you speak doubt. He didn't say, think faith. He said, speak faith. Speak, speak, speak. And every time we've gotten a little habit around here since this revelation has come, every time we say something, anything that's off, somebody will go to go, cancel that. We go, I cancel it in Jesus' name. It's so easy to make the mistake of when you're in a spiritual environment saying the right things. And the minute you get home and that person acts up, and you go, when will they ever find the truth? And you cancel that. They're finding the truth. God's working right now. These actually sound so boring, like they couldn't possibly be a revelation. Let me tell you something. It's a huge revelation. Ask the Lord. God bless you all this morning. Maintaining a spiritual disposition is the greatest discipline that you could ever undergo. It's greater than the training necessary to become an Olympic gold medalist, I believe. Because it never goes. It stays with you all your life. Let's stand together for the word of the Lord. I want to speak into your spirit today. From the book of Joshua, I'm going to read chapter from chapter 22, two verses. Verse 28 and verse 34. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And if you feel like you're ready to give up, I trust the word of God will give you a second wind and give you the strength to go on. Therefore said we that it shall be that when they should so say to us, or to our generations in time to come. Say, our generations in time to come. That we may say again, Behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. Say, us and you. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed, for it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. I'm going to, I'm going to build on something I've been preaching and teaching the past couple of services. I just feel so led to continue to build on this theme and hopefully... You were in on some of those, and it won't. I'll remind us a little bit. But catching a hold of what 
the two and a half tribes said to their other brethren, to us or to our generations in time to come, that this, this altar is a witness between us, you, and the generations that will follow. I want to preach from the subject a prophetic right of way. Let's join together and ask God's blessing upon His Word. Thank You, Lord, for the power of Your Spirit, for the mighty anointing of God upon Your people, for a future that is suffused with the power of Your presence and Your glorious anointing. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Smile at somebody. If you got a mask on, just wince your eyes. I want to define two, two uh, phrases before we go any further. First of all, what is a right-of-way? A right-of-way is a legal right to pass along a specific route through somebody else's property in order to access your own. The utility companies have right-of-ways. Some of you might live near a right-of-way that says, this is ours. We have a setback because the interstate here has a right-of-way. We can only get as close as the fence. We cannot go beyond. Once in a while, we jump the fence and go hack down some weeds and stuff. They have that right away. Then there's a rite of passage. A rite of passage is a ceremony or an event marking an important stage in someone's life. Maybe... Uh, in the in the uh, Hispanic community, they, they have the quince, is it quinceanera? Quince, when they turn 15, it's a big deal. It's kind of like quinceanera. I hope I didn't say something inappropriate in Spanish. Maybe that was my Hebrew training coming out. I don't know. But it is an event. And um, all of us have had things happen in our lives that have shaped us and maybe changed us, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. That's what you call a rite of, of, uh, of passage. So I want to remind you of the story here. Two and a half tribes had made a deal with Moses. We don't want to live on the east side of the Jordan. But we are willing to fight until every one of our brethren have possessed their inheritance. And so now I read to you, the battle is over. The enemies have been defeated. The giants have been pushed out of the perimeter of the promised land at least for the time being. And every one of the tribes are now ensconced safely in their inherited regions. So it's time for Reuben and Gad and half of the tribe of Manasseh to go back over the river to the eastern side of the Jordan and take up their abodes with their wives and children that uh, for some years now have been waiting on their return. But before they step into their camp, they cross over the Jordan and they build this massive altar. And the Scripture said it was a great altar to see to. It was big. And uh, it was noticeable. No sooner did they finish building the altar that their brethren send a war party their way, ready to do them in. 
for what they thought was an attempt to build a rival religion. How dare you, they would say. As soon as we let you go on to your own selves, you go ahead and you build another altar. Are you already prepared to serve another God? If you are, we're going to cut you. You don't want to be in a church that cuts you if you can help it. But this was a militant bunch. They had the fight in them. It takes a little while for the fight to drain out of you when you've been in the uh, trenches, so to speak. But I want you to notice, they gave a proper defense. And they said, wait, 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 wait. We don't plan to do any sacrificing. We don't plan to do any worshiping here. This is just a memorial so that in case someday, because your children may not know our children, that we might forget our shared histories. We want the next generation to be reminded that we belong to them folk over there. And we want this altar to point them to Shiloh. I hope that everything we do when we come to the house of God, whether it's worshiping or singing or giving or teaching or preaching or greeting each other, that we're always pointing people to the glory of God. There's all kinds of ways to accomplish the same thing in a church service, but this we must accomplish. We must bring people to an encounter with the presence of the Lord. And even when your preacher is failing to make the connection, then sometimes I think it's the congregation's responsibility to say, hey, it's our turn now, and we're going to close the gap until we have an anointed move of the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody's, I feel, I feel a witness out here saying, I think I'm getting what you're trying to say. We need to point people to Jesus. Put your hands together and give God some praise in this place. What I want to say is, uh, what I want to uh, explore with you is how the rite of passage, how your rite of passage, or my rite of passage, and when I say rite of passage, I mean having endured a life-changing or even life-threatening ordeal. Your rite of passage can give me my right of way. They had come back from several years of bloodshed, of warfare, of terror, of ambushments, of driving the enemy out, acre by acre out of their land. That changes a man. And when they come back, they build uh, an altar that really is a prophetic right of way. Something happens to the future of others when we have been changed by the circumstances of our past. There is something about what has happened to you that can release me from what might be the same fate. But because you got through it, you can point me to a better tomorrow. And you can give me a prophetic rite of passage into a blessed future. Come on, somebody. Have you ever wondered why you had to make so many mistakes? Well, I figured it out so that the rest of us won't have to wash, rinse, and repeat them. So you can say, hallelujah, to someone a little younger or less experienced, I've been down that road before, and the God that brought me... 
He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock to stay. He put a song in my heart that day, a song of praise. And the same God that brought me out is the same God that can keep you from falling into it. Does anybody want a prophecy of a better tomorrow? Does anybody want a promise? Does anybody want something to point you, amen, in a direction where the glory of God will meet you at the time of your greatest need? Hallelujah. And so, I want to talk about what happens. Jesus, in His first public declaration in the synagogue, after going through an ordeal, He comes and He opens the book and He reads from Isaiah 61. And after He finishes reading, He says these words, This day are these words fulfilled in your ears. Hmm. Somebody say, this day. What good does a 500 year old prophecy that goes something like this? The Spirit of the Lord is on me, for He has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, to open the prison doors to those that are bound, to heal those that are bruised, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay, I'm glad it happened to you, but what about me? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Can I say this? The closest thing to heaven on earth is when you're standing on the precipice of fulfilled prophetic Word of God. How can you say that? Because Peter said it on the day of Pentecost. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. You want to be there when prophecy is unrolled and it's happening before your very eyes. How many times have preachers and saints and visitors and folks that don't even know us have, have decreed there's coming a day when the parking lot will be full and when the people will be lining up outside the doors to get in and they'll be standing on their porches in the neighborhoods trying to get a look and a listen. I'm here to tell you something. Welcome to the future that God has created for us to walk into. You want to be here when that happens. Because when God starts fulfilling prophecy in our midst, it is your rite of passage. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, saith God, in the last days I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh and your sons. Come on, a 500-year-old prophecy can open a door of opportunity for those that haven't even been born yet. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. He said, and it's going to be for you and for your children, to them that are afar. <laughs> this that was that is still having an impact on the world 2,000 years. If that isn't a prophetic right away, I don't know what is. Prophecy. Oftentimes we think that it's just, uh, it's linear. That prophecies that were written hundreds of years ago, you know, have no real relevance unless we just happen to be right then and there when it happens. I want to tell you, prophecy is time independent.
prophecy is time dilating. Prophecy isn't just a one-way arrow shooting off into the distance. Prophecy is a feedback loop. To be on the cusp as a fulfilled Word of God, whether it comes by written prophecy or by a prophetic decree of some kind, is <laughs> to stand in the company of greatness. Hebrews says it this way, For year come on a Mount Zion to an innumerable company of angels and to the church of the firstborn. What, what, how, when, and how does that happen? How can I be in the company of angels and feel so alone? Oh. And Jesus went up to a high mountain, the Bible says, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Peter, James, and John saw Moses and Elijah. And they said, I don't know what this is, but it's good to be here. Matter of fact, it's so good to be here. Why don't we make a city out of this with a population of about six? And let's just build tabernacles and hang out. What was Elijah? What? What was Moses and Elijah doing? Prophecy was about to be fulfilled. See, the law and the prophets hinge everything about what they did and believed and practiced was a symbol of the Lamb of God that would soon take away the sins of the world. <laughs> so it's as if that when the prophecy of Jesus' ministry was coming to completion, it drew Moses and Elijah the law, the prophets. When you are baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin, you may think you go in there alone, but you don't. We are buried with Him. When God's Word is fulfilled in your experience, you are not alone. Come on. When you worship, you're not alone. When you pray, you're not alone. When you serve, you're not alone. When you fast, you're not alone. Jesus said, when you agree touching any one thing, even if you think there's just two or three of you, there's at least three or four of you, because Jesus said, I will be there in their midst. Hallelujah. I want to say to somebody, you haven't grasped a hold of your destiny yet, but you have a prophetic right of way to be something that you can't even imagine your possibility of becoming. But if you will hold on and move forward and believe God and hear and listen to what others are saying and preaching and teaching, it can get a hold of somebody. It can be changed. Somebody could be launched into a tomorrow that will blow your mind. I want this church to be launched into a destiny that I can't even comprehend. See, when God moves you, He gives you the power to move others. There are breakthrough worshipers in every congregation. There are breakthrough worshipers in this church. Who are they? They're the ones that are the first to break the surface tension when the service is a little bit tight. And what happens off time when a breakthrough worshiper gets in gear? What happens? There's a wake that follows behind them. Next thing you know, you had no plan to get involved. But there you go. Oh, 
You don't do anything without taking somebody with you. Come on. You said, but I backslid. But you came back to God, and you're going to bring a backslider back with you. Oh, but I've made mistakes. Yes, and you're going to share the wisdom learned by those mistakes and open a prophetic right away for somebody else, uh, amen, to gain ground a lot sooner than they otherwise would have because of what you can offer to them. Oh, my. I hope somebody hears what I'm saying. And Moses took with him the bones of Joseph. This is Exodus 13 and 19, who had required a solemn oath of the Israelites, saying, God will surely take notice of you. Joseph is old now. I know y'all got a future. I know God's taking you places. I have but one request. When you go, take me with you. When God's promise to get you out of this bondage comes to pass, remember this, boys, it's not just for you. Dig me up wherever you got me buried and take my bones with you because when you go, I go. When you're blessed, I'm blessed. When you shout, I shout. When you break through, I break through. When you're delivered, I'm delivered. When you're encouraged, it encourages. And it was Joseph himself that when his father Jacob was dying, he said, don't let me be buried out here in Egypt. I want you to take me to the cave at Mount Peth where Sarah is buried and where Isaac is buried. And so the Bible says, Joseph got permission of Pharaoh and with horsemen and chamberlains and regal splendor, he has the perhaps one of the greatest funeral uh, 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 processions that took the body of Abraham all the way into the land of promise. I want to tell you something. Say, well, you know, when God finally, when God finally makes it happen, I'll, I'll shout, Pastor. No, you're going to have to learn to live in it before anyone else gets there. Abraham said, "I know y'all. Yeah, I, I know y'all are in Egypt, and look, they were going to spend the next hundreds of years there. But I want you to get me out where you're headed. I'm going to get out in front of you. Come on, we need. You know what? You can, you can live healed." You can have pain in your body and live in the land of promised healing simultaneously. You just got to say, Jesus, take me over where the healing is. You can have a backslidden child and celebrate even right now as if they were sitting right beside you by faith. My wife said, faith speaks of the things that are not as though they are. Somebody take me to the promised land. Somebody take me to where the church is running thousands. Somebody take me where we're not always scraping the bottom of the barrel to put a few bucks together to do something for God. Somebody take me to where the shadow of Peter glances over somebody sick and there's a miraculous healing. I'm there. I don't know about you, but I'm I'm there already by faith in Jesus' name. And so he sat by the pool for 38 years. Jesus walks up. Maybe it was his anniversary. Hey, bud. What you here for? Oh, man, you won't believe it. Every time the angel of the Lord stirs the water up, one of these, one of these healthier whippersnappers jumps right in in front of me and gets my healing. I've been here for 38 years. And I, and I have no man. Jesus was about to show him you don't need a man. You have a voice. 
you have a prayer. You, your soul prints ought to be all over this place by now. After 38 years, you should not be saying, I have no man. You ought to be the man. When, when the fulfillment of everything that you've been praying for God to do steps into your sphere of experience, God, give us the wisdom to recognize the day of our visitation. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Somebody who felt like they had no man, no prayer, no hope, no dream, no friend, no church, no promise. Jesus could be walking right into your world right now. This may be, I, Holy Ghost, kick back here. I feel like the thing you've been waiting for God to do is upon you now in Jesus' name. Reach out and receive it in the name of Jesus. Come on, get it, get it. What do you want me to do for you? I need you to get your word fulfilled because I can't move forward until you move forward. Don't you understand? It helps everybody for you to get your promise. I, want to, I just want to close with this idea of generational right of ways. We talk about generational curses. We ignore generational blessings. Genesis chapter 50 begins with a promise Joseph makes to Jacob to take him to the promised land and bury him with Sarah. Genesis chapter 50 begins that way and it ends with Joseph on the edge of death making his brethren promise to take his bones to the land of promise. Your present is somebody else's future. Your blessing is somebody else's opportunity. Your destiny is somebody else's prophetic right of way. God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. The glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former. There is going to be a, a gully wash and revival in the last days. He's going to find somebody to use. I want to be a part of that. I want this church to share in that kind of destiny. But in order, amen, to give the world around us a, a prophetic right away into the glory of God, we've got to get what God wants for us first. We cannot take them anywhere we haven't been ourselves. You know that going to hell is a generational matter. John eight and forty four says, "Ye are of your father the devil, and his and the lusts of your father you will do." He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not the truth, because there's no truth in him. Jesus also said in Matthew twenty three and fifteen, "Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land." To make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Boy, does the devil know how to reproduce. Think about it. He said, You make them twice as evil as you are. I can't wait to see the day. If this church, if you right here under the sound of my voice, whatever you are was doubled, what kind of church would we have? Well, it depends. I, 
when it comes to finances, two times zero is still zero. Americans spend roughly 35 minutes a day grooming. Some a little less. They spend 45 minutes a day commuting to and from work. They spend 35 minutes a day doing house chores and about two minutes a day praying. What if, what if this church had double your prayer life? Going to hell is generational because they're progeny of the evil, the father of lies, which is Satan. Then going to heaven is generational too. Second Tim- Timothy 1 and 5, Paul said to Timothy, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, it dwelt first in your grandmother, and then Lois, and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded. What am I preaching about? A prophetic rite of passage. Grandmama blazed the trail that led to three generations of apostolic revival. Uh, Do we have any trailblazers in the house? Do we have anybody ready and willing to set this church up for three generations of Holy Ghost revival? Oh, hallelujah. Then let's get our breakthrough. Let's get our word fulfilled. Let's get our promises coming to pass because we're going to take them with us. In closing, Jesus is He's, uh, he's, he's really under the last moments of, of breath that he has, suffering this cruel death on Calvary. He is flanked by two thieves. Both of them begin by mocking him. But then Jesus says something along the way that takes the mockery out of one, at least. I believe it's when Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. See, the two thieves basically represent all of mankind. One of the thieves kept on mocking because all he wanted was relief. And if you're here because all you want It's a little bit better life. I hope you get it. But that's not what I'm guaranteeing to you today. The second thief, all he wanted was forgiveness. And he says, remember me. Why did he say, remember me? He was saying, Jesus. That's exactly what Joseph said. Don't forget me, boys. When you go into your promised land, don't forget me. Remember me. 200 years later, they remembered him. Jesus said, I recognize that. That's the spirit of Joseph. What was he saying? Your breakthrough is my breakthrough. Where you go, I can go. What happens to you affects me. Take me with you, Jesus. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. It was prophesied in Psalm 22, but hundreds of years later, it became a right of way for someone who was a... Dis- Actually, he's the greatest thief that ever lived. 
What do I want to be when I grow up? I want to be a thief. I want to steal like this man stole. What did he steal? He stole God's heart. I want us to stand. When you realize that when God does something for anybody that He's promised in His Word He would do, and when He does it for the church, when He does it for your neighbor, He opens up a prophetic I can say here with confidence that if you have a drug addiction problem, there is a prophetic right of way for you to be delivered. How do I know that? Because of you and you and you and you and you and you and you. When He did it for them, He did it for you. I can tell you if you're battling with suicide or poor self-esteem or you want to just end your life, There are people under the sound of my voice that's been exactly where you were. And God gave them a second chance and a reason to live. And he, when He did that for them, He did it for you. There it is. The massive altar pointing the way to the glory. If somebody needs God to do something, if somebody wants to break into a new dimension, if somebody is in pursuit of a divine destiny, would you just come and gather around the front for a minute? Praise God. Praise God. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here today. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here today. Mm, hallelujah. 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 Imagine the first one who's when Peter's shadow passed over them and they were healed, that wouldn't be the last one. Because the first one to get a healing like that opened a right away for others to line the streets, the Bible said. Oh my God. If you ever need help, find somebody that God has done for them what you need and to do for you and ask them, Lay your hand on me. Bless me. Speak into my spirit. Oh, Rama.